one other hurt pilot. Thank you. It's amazing stories. Yeah, a year or two before that, we were working at Monterey with Chad and uh, trying to get some dives in, and the weather was just so horrible, we couldn't do anything. Yeah, that, so you were out with them the year before when they discovered yeah. the... Yeah, yeah. And we, but we had, we had to go to... Uh, we had to go re-spool a cable uh, because oh, yeah. we had that uh, <laughs> tension problem uh, in the direct drive winch, and we went all the way to Scripps down in San Diego to yeah. spend a few days. And this is all during the Monterey leg, so we're stuck in San Diego doing that job. But the reward was when we finally got back to Monterey and finally got a dive in, it was Octopus Garden. So. Yeah, Chad was feeling a little self-conscious because first is the cable, then it was Argus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was like bad luck on that. And Monterey, it can, the weather can be nasty off Monterey, boy. Yeah. And uh, it's not an easy place to work sometimes. I think we had to spend more time in Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary instead of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, that project. Yeah. I was uh, just talking about that during dinner, that, that there was, you know, one really shallow dive in the Channel Islands that maybe hadn't been planned and was just, um, you know, we had a day and so that's what we could do. And, you know, being that shallow, it's like the ship does everything we wanted to do. The weather was easy and it yeah. just felt like vacation, you know. All right. <laughs> the time to ascend was like 10 minutes. Yeah. It's very pleasant. You're looking over at these beautiful islands. Yeah. Sunset, <laughs> sea, sea lions swimming around. Perfect weather. <laughs> yeah, 15.9, almost 16 meters a minute. I'll try uh, more windshield wiper action. I think this is an interesting question. Why are the rocks so black? Well, basalt lava lava generally is is black when it cools, and uh, basaltic rocks generally are black in color, and the uh, basalt makes up the majority of the ocean crusts, but also the um, the manganese coating, the the patina, or the uh, manganese oxide coating on the rocks, is black in color as well. So we have a a black alteration process, black colored alteration process on top of a black rock. So they, yes, they're very black. Thank you. Um, there was another one that I think I thought everyone could answer. Do they feed you well on the ship? <laughs> What's your favorite meal they serve? So, uh, Katachi's going to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the food's pretty great. And, uh, um, I actually get a little bit seasick on the transits and... It's a real bummer for me because I, I enjoy eating so much. I, en I enjoy it as an activity. So I kind of force myself to still eat the same amount because <laughs> the food's really tasty. Um, we got a bunch of um, cooks from Eastern Europe. So they, they make food from all over, but uh, they, they make a lot of food from where they come from. It's really nice. 
Awesome, thank you. Anybody else want to share their favorite meal they've had on board thus far? Pizza followed by ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Not this cruise. No. no birthday one. carrot cake was pretty the good. Birthday the other carrot day. cake was pretty good. Mm. Yeah, they uh, they always make a cake for for a birthday on board. I still have ice cream brain. <laughs> <laughs> Churros drenched in syrup. <laughs> yeah, I ate like three too many of those. <laughs> Back to the black rock question. The the um, basaltic rocks are. Uh, called mafic uh, compared to continental ro rocks which are felsic and so the mafic color is dark because it's made up of mafic minerals like pyroxene and olivine which are yeah. dark looking crystals mm. whereas in granites on continental rocks you have more quartz which is like a light colored mineral mm. So that kind of explains, it's really the mineralogy of the rocks that I think explains the color. I see. Thank you. Do you have a favorite fish that you hope to see on your dives? I'm an invertebrate person, so I don't know if I have a favorite fish. I really like those Sanafa branchid eels we saw a couple of today. Mm. I think they're very cool. Uh, it's always exciting to see sharks, so mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see some sharks. We saw, I think we saw one last dive, but not today. What was the fish we saw when we first came on watch, that orange guy? Oh, chonoclops. chonoclops. Those are pretty fun with the frowny face. Yeah. I feel like I may have missed that. Oh, you missed it? They have a big, just really sad looking frowny face. <laughs> has anyone seen an angler fish before on these dives? That chonoclops is actually a type of angler fish. They're not like as dramatic as the ones you see in the, the midwater that have the big lure on top of their head. Um, mm -hmm. Those are actually way smaller than you would think. Those angler fish, they're actually really the really couple tight. centimeters. Oh, really? Um, but they are, when you get a really good close-up on them, pretty amazing looking to see. I've never seen one actually on a dive, but... Yeah, we've seen a few, not, not around here. Not, not lately. I remember years past seeing them. I kind of like tripod fish. They're kind of interesting. They just kind of sit there on their little tripod legs. Kind of weird. Tripod fish. I got to see this. Hey. Um. Maybe whoever's here can can answer one of the this question. Um, what's the most amazing thing you have seen on an ascent or descent? I max out at squid. That's the cool, that's the coolest <laughs> thing I've seen on an ascent. Yeah, the, the squid attack was actually that was. Hmm. Because usually the ascents aren't very exciting, but that was all of a sudden we were surrounded by a whole lot of squid that were not happy to see this 5,000 pound yellow thing with a bunch of bright lights <laughs> float through its school. Whoa. Thank you. Was anyone present for that time that the whale, the juvenile whale, um, came across? I, there's a, I'm, there might be a, vi it's probably on the website, yeah? The yeah, it's on the website. If you guys want to um, later on look on our Nautilus Live website or AV Nautilus website, there's a video there of um, 
it happened during an ascent descent um, moment and all you see is this whale a sperm whale come into camera and is just like just cruising around checking out what's this big yellow thing in the water and it's a really cool video yeah that's one of the coolest shots i think i've ever seen totally Alrighty, I'm um, good morning Norway. 12 hours ahead of us, yes. Um, will you make a highlight video for YouTube from the dive? I'm pretty sure. Y yes, yes. Mm hmm. We will definitely. I think they do one for every cruise. I don't know if they do a highlight reel for each dive. Not for each dive, but they do for the cruise. Mm -hmm. They're they'll they'll be getting this footage back on shore, and they'll do their little editing magic. And uh, any particular, you know, really crazy highlights, they'll usually also um, make sure to to send those out pretty pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Like the squid attack. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Um, uh, I'm just trying to, I, f I can't keep count or I'm having a hard time keeping up with these comments coming in. Got a very active um, set of watchers here. Super, super cool. Thank you. Um, what is the weirdest, weirdest but cutest cre creature down there in the depths? A, uh, and that's a great one. A highlight to look up are um, the flamboyant squid worm and the gulper eel. Both of those, I didn't get to see them live. I wasn't uh, piloting at those times, but both those videos are kind of in, in my top favorites for sure. Yeah, that Chonacops is a good example of weird but cute, too. <laughs> totally. I feel like sea anemones are, like, in general. You think they're cute? I, they're so weird, <laughs> but they're so cute. And then what, watching it being picked up yesterday, how it, like, curled all together and, like, made whatever it did and I was like that's so cute and weird all at the same time because it's like slimy looking awesome okay lots of questions coming in um, little intertidal anemones are really fun because you can sort of take like little muscles or something and plop them right in their mouth and then they'll close all their tentacles up on it and Whoa. sort of like take it all in. It's really fun to watch. That's like Whoa. one of my favorite things to do when I'm in like the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you have to show me one day, hopefully, please. Interesting question. What was the biggest creature you have seen that has never been seen before? That's a tough. That's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> biggest creature I've seen that is. Well, we've seen some. Probably some big corals that have probably, and sponges especially, um, that are potentially new species. Mm -hmm. um, that can be quite large. Like we've seen some sponges today that were like as wide as Hercules. Whoa! I missed it. Oh, man. So maybe a great follow-up question with that too. I know is. Um, the process for identifying a new species can take a while, and maybe you know a little bit about that you can talk to us about, too. Yeah, so typically, um, these days it involves um, describing a lot about the morph, so taking a, a, a specimen back to the lab, describing a lot about its morphology and how it fits in with all the other species we already know about. Um, and oftentimes that takes like redescribing the group that it's in um, if this sort of changes our ideas about how these things are related to one another. Um, oftentimes you have to get um, a sample of its DNA as well so you can um, 
better identify how it fits into its whatever group of organisms it's in. Um, so yeah, it can be a really lengthy process. Um, and so taxonomists are a really valuable tool um, and we need more of them actually because it's, um, it can be a sort of really long, arduous process that not enough people are doing. And so we have more scientists doing other kinds of work while we still don't even know what that we're working on because there's not enough people describing species. Do you have an estimate between, let's say, you know, we made a discovery and found a new species of coral, uh, how long would it take to actually get that then confirmed as a new species? Hmm. Many months, probably. It, it, probably a, a minimum of, of six months, probably. Um, people work on new species for years at a time, maybe, if they have other things going on, you know. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, someone in the chat is noting that, yeah, we've seen, there have been sponges seen um, in the monument, actually, that are approximately the size of like a minivan. So yeah, some of these sponges can get really, really huge. Very interesting thing. Um, so the Kumulipo, the story of how Hawaii was created or the creation story um, starts here in the depth of the ocean with the with the coral polyp. And I've never actually officially learned the song, but I know how it goes. And I just looked it up on um, on, on our magical online here. And um, it shows me this book. And I think I actually brought the book with me. There was a, a a handful of books that were like, you need to take me on this voyage. And thus far, the books have been favored by the crowd. <laughs> so I'm going to have to pull that one out of my cabin. It's still still down there, and I have to try and see what my kumu says about it. I didn't know the origin story went back to a coral polyp. That's mm -hmm. so cool. Ka'uku ko'a ko'a is a, the coral. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder what type of coral it was. I know. I'm pretty sure they identify it. So when I when I find it, I'll I'll have to let you know. Yeah, we'll have to figure that out. Yeah. Um, interesting comment. It takes up to two to three years to get new species, depending on the science community animal group that they are under. Yeah, it can definitely take years. It's very difficult work too. Very can be very tedious. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah. So shout out to all the taxonomists. You guys are do you guys are doing great things. Thank you, taxonomists. Yeah, and then actually in the Kumulipo there are two major wa or times. So there's the time that's in the darkness and then the time that's in the in the light. And then man is made in the time that they're, or like, I think right at the junction of, of the two, where we become, where pole becomes all, or where night becomes light. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then um, Ipo brought this book with her, the Olelo no Eao book that has all the Hawaiian proverbs in it, which is a really awesome resource that most Hawaiian, not most, uh, that we have in my house. <laughs> we have like a couple of those copies and it's really good to have. I'll have to check those out. Are those in, are those out for? 
Um, Ipo, I think, brings it in and out of her cabin, but I'm pretty sure if you asked her, she'd be open to sharing that with you. For sure. And then um, I'll bring out the kumulipo and I'll add it to my little space on, on the, <laughs> at the library. Great. Yeah. very inspirational forcing me to make sure that I get my kumulipo haps going <laughs> okay guys we need to come up with a watch name that's true what do you guys think front what do you guys in the front row what do you think of that watch names Maybe we can crowdsource it a little from the chat too well, right now we're just the delivery watch because yeah. every watch we've done, we've been bringing the vehicle back to the surface. Yeah, mm. the Ascenders. But that's not a very good name for our watch. <laughs> I missed the name. What was it? The Ascenders. The Ascenders. <laughs> Dan often refers to this as the uh, the pit crew. Like we just turn around the vehicle, get yeah. it in the water, and then set it up for everyone else to pilot. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind that. Yep. Do your eight to twelve on deck and uh, get the get them in the water and go have go take your break. What are we? Uh, we have a bit of a transit coming up, do we? Yeah. Mapping our way back to the south, back towards the heavier weather. <laughs> I think it's gonna be okay tomorrow. We'll see. <laughs> 15 hours. You uh, moving north there, are you, George? No. Val just said that, that makes the 12 to 4 shift the undertakers well. where the ascenders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you headed north, are you? It's like a Marvel uh, movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Roger. I don't understand this comment. How is the watch that spouts off all the ho crazy Hawaiian vocabulary? Oh. <laughs> I was Kay. saying we should have a, a, a good Hawaiian name. We should have a good Hawaiian name. We can do that. What was that? What do you want? Yeah. No, oh. oh, where's my spinner? <laughs> Ascenders <Trade> assemble. <laughs> Ascenders assemble. <laughs> Or descenders too, right? Mm-hmm. True. There, there was this movie I watched. It's called Jupiter is Ascending. Hercules is Ascending. <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter is Ascending. That was a good flick. I'm trying to remember if I saw that. I can well, hear you. Yeah. Maybe next dive we'll... Uh, lucky enough to be on the seafloor the whole time. Yeah, it should be All a 16 right, no hour dive. There is a question right. about going back to 24 hour dives. This mission has sort of a different goal. We're trying to cover a lot of ground and do lots of dives in lots of different areas and get quality samples, but uh, in shorter amounts of time. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, probably not going to be 24 hours. I bet when they go to Johnston Atoll, uh, two expeditions from now, it'll be back to 24 hour, if I had to guess. Mm. So Kinda just nice senders the staggered then. dives that different, uh, we get different pit crews, right? That's right. Yeah. Always get the, breaks the routine up a bit for us. This comment is so funny, and it's going to stick with me for a little bit. We are the senders. <laughs> Hercules retrievers. <laughs> Last expedition, we were Delta Dan and the arachnoids. <laughs> <laughs> 
Delta Dan and the and the what was that last part? The arachnoids. Arachnoids. Yeah, none of us in the front row like spiders, and oh. everyone in the back row like sea spiders. Oh. Sounds like a group of scientists. Yeah. <laughs> We could probably make something up about the way George is driving the ship with all these uh, squiggly lines. <laughs> <laughs> George is headed further north. He's like ready to go to Alaska or bust. <laughs> he needs to cool off some more. Uh, the Hawaiian name for George is Kilki. Uh, maybe I'll see how he feels about me calling him Kilki. What's the Hawaiian word for king? King? Yeah. Mm, Mo'i. Mm, Mo'i. M O Okina I. And the O and the I have a macron on top, a kahako. What is everyone's Maybe favorite? Maybe we could be uh, King George in the runoffs. <laughs> <laughs> King George and the, what was that? And the runoffs. Runoffs. <laughs> <laughs> You know he's up there just laughing. It, it right was now. an yeah, he's laughing at us. It was an amazing <laughs> move that he spun all the way around and twisted us all up, and like Argus didn't move at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe George would get the tether wrapped around Herc like that. He does have SPL on his panel, and I'm waiting for him to jump in at any moment here. Mark got to see all that as well, so I had to hear about it when I went in the galley. So. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. <clears throat> what happened with that? Uh, I let go of the stick and the uh, current was 50 50 which way it would go. And it's the wrong 50. Yeah, you were busy, so it's, it likes to come across and get in there. If you, uh, we were level with Atlanta and we turned into it instead of turning away from it. Yeah. Rookie mistake. So, is the bridge listening to SPL too? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes they do. Well, I, we, we, we should, we should clarify that. No, not all the time, mm -hmm. but George is pretty savvy, and yes, he's listening to SPL. <laughs> Aren't George. you, George? Hi, George. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is everyone's favorite creature that you wish you can have on the ship right now? Interesting. Oh, I've got, I've got. This one ready. My dog back home. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah, same. I, I do not think you would enjoy being on a ship, but <laughs> I want him here, that's for sure. Yeah, it's funny. I miss you, honey, and I miss you, kids, but I really miss my dog. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's something about it that you can't tell them where you're going and why. Oh. You know? They're just at the door when you see you. What they they watch you pack your bags, and their puppy eyes are just watching you packing Don't up say that. all your things. And they wait by the door. Or oh, no, no, let's oh, not go here. Me sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making it worse. Sorry about that. Uh, My dog pouts for about three days, and then he becomes uh, Deanna's best friend because <laughs> she feeds him. <laughs> take your dog to work? <laughs> no, that no. <laughs> I don't think that would go well. I uh, 
back in school, I'd bring him into my office there because I had a good little office. We could just like hang out, and I could, if I was doing computer work, that would work out well. Oh, sweet. But uh, hardware, like lab stuff, is uh, <laughs> he's not a lab lab. It's not conducive to having dog hair in the. <laughs> Yeah, what is this DNA? Oh, it's <laughs> dog. <laughs> From the bottom of the ocean? I do bring my dog to the lab sometimes and I think about that. <laughs> I went to visit uh, I went to visit Sexton, the people that make the um, still camera on the vehicle I was home last time right up the road from my house. You walk in the shop and the first thing you see is the shop dog <laughs> you know, polish you around, wanders around the shop and the office. And then uh, there was a couple more people that had their dogs just hanging out. Nice. You know, it's a cool place to work. You can bring your dog to work. I just got a text from my partner. You don't want me there? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully mine's sleeping. So. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought it'd be late enough. <laughs> Sorry, Gabby. Some dedication. Partner watching at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Wow. Some of our viewers are very committed and they stay up till four AM watching. So so this person's pretty grateful that these hours aren't these dives aren't as long as our um twenty four hour dives. Are they addicted to the un beautiful undersea imagery or <laughs> or are or a colorful commentary. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, dear viewer, viewers, are you guys interested in the view or the listening part of, it's of both, it all? But not, that's what makes Nautilus Live so great. It's, it's a little of both. I have a dedicated Raspberry Pi 4 at home with two screens, so I can have <laughs> stream on each one. <laughs> What's the coolest thing you guys have seen so far? Um, I think the bubblegum coral yeah. covered in basket stars for me takes the cake pretty yeah. easily. That was pretty I spectacular. That's, yeah, for sure. That was cool. I, uh, I really liked your description yesterday about that word for just like abundant life and growth because that's really what I was like thinking or feeling and then you had the perfect word in Hawaiian for it was really cool. Yeah, what was that again? Ulu vehi vehi. Yeah. To just grow abundantly and I compared it to the girl that has powers to make plants grow out of anything. Mm. Just From Encanto, right? From Encanto, yes. The movie. <laughs> Um, the viewer, the, one of our um, walk, people watching at home says they like both. Yeah. The view and the commentary. <coughs> yeah. I think the coolest thing I've seen thus far is watching Mark manhandle the vehicles into the ocean and back on deck. I'm just like. <laughs> Now that's what you call handle that. <laughs> Mark's the man. Totally.
when What's you the other one look like, Paul? The went the bottom left. The that view? No, the it's either winch all or winch storage. Mm -hmm. If you stick it here on that. You want that one? Yeah. Oh, well, there's two cameras there at oh. once. One's winch alt and one's winch storage. I just remembered that I don't know how to actually do this, and the last time I did, I messed up the uh, whole thing. H21 is the destination. Yeah, right. it meant the multi viewer 2 1. That one? Yeah, then there's uh, what's winch alt look like? Winch alt's just that off the. Future winch. Which one's the access camera? Everything except future winch. Winch alt is a marshal down there. Everything else are uh, the access cameras. Yeah, winch hold is the one I want. Yeah, that's the one. No better angle. For me, at least. Which hold? That way, <coughs> if there's a gap, you can see it coming around the drum before it does a full rev. You know, catch it earlier. Got it. Like this little micro gap on the right there. <coughs> And you can uh, see the level line working. Yeah. Some of the comments coming in. <clears throat> um, the dream of escaping this um, Silicon Valley software engineering nightmare of a job and doing what you, what you all do is why I stay around to watch Nautilus Live. Um, it's a little bit of both, like he said. Also, the late night shifts can be a whole lot of fun. All the late watches have a lot of fun in the delirium of crazy hours and precision remote piloting operations. We tend to get a little giddy and silly at times, but our focus is always on uh, What's doing that, the job. <laughs> yep. Okay. Oh, well, you have a friend. Yes. <laughs> Aloha, Mahi Alani. I miss you all. Um, good question. Why did everyone decide to join? Oh, look, there's a little jellyfish. Oh, and another one. Cool. Anyhow, why did everyone decide to join the Nautilus team? Let's see. Kotachi, you want to answer first? Is this a all right time to? We've uh, we've actually got some nav and mm. ship stuff for a second. Yeah, just just maybe start with the back row. Standing by. So for me, it's uh, sort of a, a privilege and a pleasure to be asked to, to join um, as a scientist. Gives me a little break from all the lab and computer work I do. And uh, Beth Orcutt, one of the co-chief scientist on this expedition um, brought me along to help out with some of the biology stuff. So it wasn't really a decision, it was a an ask and I said yes Perfect. very gladly. <laughs> cool. Yeah, me too pretty much, but I've been doing this for 22 years now, so a few more expeditions than Ryan, but uh, 
basically get asked, and uh, I love doing it, so I come out and do it a couple times a year, usually. Awesome, thank you guys. I think we're a little bit more sorted up here now, too. Um, there's some... Chatting with George. Can you, uh, what was the question again? Um, why did you decide to join the Nautilus team? Oh. Yeah, I could start. Um, my PI, uh, my professor at school asked if I wanted to come and I think it's a huge privilege. I've been following Nautilus since 2018. Um, I was actually introduced to it from uh, by Jessica, who's one of the Herc pilots. I was uh, an undergrad working in a lab very close to her lab while she was a PhD student. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a really exciting opportunity for me to be here. I uh, also got hooked in during school and I think like the third year of my PhD um, and you know really one of my goals is to do robotics for science so trying to come up with new technologies and deploy them in ways that can help scientists collect more data from harder reach locations um, all across earth and space ideally so uh, getting to actually do this in person by hand and, and see some of this implemented has just been awesome. I didn't realize you guys were both uh, yeah. spies. Yeah, <laughs> Jess, uh, Jess and I were in the same PhD lab and she was also uh, the person who clued me in about the Nautilus internships and, and helped get me out here. That's funny, my story's uh, similar. Several of my associates uh, worked aboard Nautilus, and um, I've been on three different uh, people I've worked with on other vessels, and they always said this is the best ship they've ever worked on, the most fun, the most dynamic, and I just couldn't say en enough good things about it. So I, I was trying for years to get a slot on here, and. Um, Finally, it worked out with uh, my schedule and the Nautilus's schedule, and I've uh, been lucky to come back every year since. Definitely the funnest ship ever to work on. Yeah, here, here. I agree. I've sailed on lots of different ships, and this is the best. Awesome, thank you. Jeff, you want to share your... your oh, uh, I just do it for the money. <laughs> 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 uh, no, actually a friend of mine um, that I've known for a very long time has a friend who is the video manager out on Nautilus. And uh, just kind of, he, he was talking about it one day, I said, you know, that kind of sounds cool. And had enough free time, enough vacation time from another job came out. 2017 or 18, did mobilization and shakedown and didn't get too seasick, so I thought, no, oh, this is okay, and they keep calling me up, so. And it, it has been, I mean, going to the South Pacific and looking for Amelia Earhart, that's like, you tell people that, and they're like, what? Yeah, we're, we're looking for Amelia Earhart. We didn't find her, by the way, but that was fun. And it's a good group of people. You always, I come out here and it's always, you learn something from somebody. It's yeah, very, every time. Yeah, very cool people out here that, you know, it, it, and they, it has to be a cool group of people because we're stuck together on a 230 <laughs> foot boat for the next, you know, month. So you can't have weird people. <laughs> totally. <laughs> There'll be a man overboard that nobody knew about. Yeah, <laughs> we're all we're all a little weird. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and, and, I mean, and there's there is some truth in the humor, and that you know we all are our own little odd duck that you know, and and that's what makes it so cool. Mm -hmm. it's like One other thing I'll add is, even though a lot of us you know had a friend or knew someone on the ship, I mean, 
Katachi and I. I mean, I definitely got in through the internship program and applying that way. And a lot of the other people have just gotten their start from just applying um, and having well, good experience. What, and, what was the comment from the, the guy from, or the person from Silicon Valley? It's like, hey, you know what? Um, one of the positions we ought to have out here that does not sit in the van and talk so you don't know about it is a data engineer. There is a whole ton of networks and servers and computers and KVM switchers and everything else that needs to be babysat and will break and does need to be fixed. It does break. Yeah. Oh yeah, it does. <laughs> there's there's got to be what at least a dozen computers just in the front row here and I have no idea what happened. Oh, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. All running different software and a lot of it homegrown too that requires software engineers to debug and so the input page on our KVM router is 80 sources. Whoa. Wow. 80. 80. Yeah. Wow. I mean, to, to be fair, that's not all computers. That's, you know, pseudo computers. But yeah, 80, 80 sources that we have in the KVM switcher so that people can see computers. Yeah, it's like eight pages? Yep. Ten, ten sources per eight page? Eight pages, yep. Eight pages, ten sources per page. Yeah, just finding the right computer can be a challenge. Too. Yeah. Whoa. It's really great. Every <coughs> Sunday night, they all update. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it actually was last night, but it was. Uh, yeah, walked into a computer that was like, "Oh, I didn't really want you to do that." Mm. Well, within my reach, there's what one, two, three, four, all the ones in the back row: five, six, seven, eight, nine. We'll leave your rack alone. How many can be? But yeah, there's nine just right here. Wow. Yeah, there's eight I'm looking at here. I'll keep this in mind next time I want to throw my one laptop out the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and we're running every flavor of operating system you can think of. And hardware. And hardware. And that's not including Raspberry Pis. I mean, those are floating around here like you know. Yeah, there's at least, well, there's probably two dozen of them on the network. Yeah. Not to mention that we're 2,000 miles away from any major land mass and 1,000 miles away from any other groups of people while currently live streaming <laughs> to the internet on YouTube with high speed <laughs> internet beaming to a satellite. <laughs> There's a debate as to high speed, how high speed that high speed is, but yeah, it does work. High speed for ships. Yeah, it's rocking. Yeah, rocking for, rockin ships. for ships. Definitely. But when we're on a transit and there's 40 people all trying to do anything because we're on a transit, it gets a little slow. <clears throat> One of our viewers um, really wants to know the amount of storage space on average an expedition uses or is normally stored on the mm -hmm. ship. Are you talking about data? We're about a terabyte a day. Yeah. Wow. We had that question last cruise and Tim came up with uh, how many terabytes were storage that he has down there in the rack room. I forget what the number was, but it was it was quite impressive. Going back to all the tapes that are down there or just what's online? <laughs> just what's online? Yeah. A couple hundred I think. Yeah. We have uh every tape of every vi video and data uh file that's ever been written on this ship back at the Inner Space Center and we have also for the Okeanos Explorer, we have 1,300 tapes and wow. uh, I think 2.5 petabytes of data wow. in 10 year, uh, 11 years. There should be enough data there, Dwight, to get our <laughs> AI animal recognition system up and running. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would think. Should be a little smarter than fish and <laughs> sea star. We, we definitely have the 
the data sets to train the algorithm. We just need some software engineer to write the algorithm. <laughs> we have a few of those around. Now, re for real, we are going to start migrating a lot of the content to the cloud. Um, and that means different things, but uh, video files, when you upload them to Amazon Web Services, you can rename them, recode them, transcode them, uh, make them accessible to machine learning, etc. Because yeah. tapes on a shelf are not usable. Well, they can be usable, but it's a chore. But you think about it, what, 917 dives and 138 expeditions? It's a lot of data. So you're, you're going to transfer all that to the Amazon Web Services, are you? Uh, we're, we're doing little chunks and we're gauging the costs and uh, oh. it's very inexpensive to put it into Glacier, but it costs money to pull it out. <laughs> so we're evaluating access and needs and availability and all that sort of stuff. So we're doing little chunks at a time and mm -hmm. gauging what it costs and making sure that it's the right thing to do. And then that will be uh, public, publicly available once it's once it's out there. Potentially, yeah. I mean, it will be when it goes to the archive uh, at NCEI, which is the NOAA uh, National Center for Environmental Information. It'll right. it's publicly available there. But the first step is getting it into the cloud so that they can get it. And then uh, you know we'll probably have select data sets available for things like AI, ML, and other purposes in a controlled way but but they NOAA didn't want us to have a second repository but there's a lot of debate right now about what how long it takes to get the data available through the main repository it takes six months yeah so that's kind of too long of a time you know I'm always disappointed when we uh, map over a cool feature and it doesn't instantly appear on Google, Google yeah. Ocean. So. <laughs> We've made steps in the right direction the last couple of years because we're doing whole dive recordings on YouTube. Uh -huh. And uh, for the last three years, I think, um, every Nautilus dive is available on YouTube. I think through OET's YouTube channel. That's besides the the live twelve hour rewind. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the live twelve hour rewind is great because that's instantaneous, but the whole dive recording takes about a week to get posted. I see. Sometimes two weeks. But we're trying to think of ways to make that almost instantaneous, just with longer. YouTube keeps changing their rules and uh, structure of how it works and uh, we're thinking now we could just have really long events and just have the whole thing instead of being a 12 hour buffer just have the whole thing be lo one long event for each dive takes a little management though and someone's got to deal with it it would be cool to have a have that aboard as well on the live uh, yeah so we could rewind and do highlights Uh, same with the uh, still image, uh, that going into a, a buffer for you guys in the back row to be able to look back at in the last five yeah. minutes or whatever. Yeah, we sort of can. Uh, the uh, whole C log integration here has got that capability built in. You can click through oh, C log yeah. and uh, click on like yesterday's dive, and I can replay. Uh, screen grabs from it and stuff like that. I haven't poked around in C-Log before to get a... Yeah, it's, a, it's, not, perf a it's not perfect yet. It's, it's steps in the right direction. We're getting there. 
You can play highlights on that too from yesterday's uh, day. Not video. Not video. Just, just captures. Just tills. Yeah, but I forget how to do it. <laughs> we'll have to spend some time playing with it. If you go to the review cruises, dives, you can go to different cruises, different dives, and you should, but I know it's not fully integrated yet, so it might not work perfectly. Gallery. The video, the SCFs, I don't know oh, she left. The SCFs identify. Uh, identify video highlights too that we should have access to somehow. But yeah, like there's, there's the, uh, yeah, there's the anemone we collected last night. Yep. Cool. Can I come back and see that? Yeah. Yeah, we don't have that on our. Uh, just pull up the, uh, right. pull up the chief side computer on your KVM. All right, it's up. I don't think I have a mouse for it, though. No. You have uh, I know. You might just be able to view my screen. I don't know. You have yeah. to put it on your Argus machine to have a mouse. Or engineer. Yeah. You can put it on engineer. Or you should just be able to. Do you guys You guys don't use C-Log, I guess. Katachi does. No, yeah. we, we, we don't. <laughs> Stick it on engineer, Paul. Sort of a nice little time lapse of this collection yeah. there. It's cool. So this must be the snaps that you took, Fiona. Or, mm. yeah. These trying aren't auto timed. To, trying to get the urchin. Oh yeah. yeah. Um. Some. I don't know. Were you taking this many snaps, or I don't no? Think it's good. That's, <laughs> that's not what he's talking about. So I don't know what dual. I don't know if we have it up here. You can't see my computer? Yeah, sorry. <coughs> no. Yeah, just one of the one of the login computers, if you want, just open up the C log tab. And uh, somebody has to log in with an account, but once you do you can go review review dives and then click on the dive you want to review and click on gallery and you can see all this all this. Oh captures. I see the C log here. Yeah. I just see this on a different tab. Yeah, it's got Argus, Argus and Herc. Yep. Let me see. Let's see if we can find the thing from yesterday. Thousands of them. <laughs> if 
you up the number of images per page, would you have to scroll less? Oh, yeah. 80. Thanks. Although it takes a while to load a page then. something <laughs> <laughs> yeah go ahead huh. go ahead George I suppose I'm doing it right uh, we'll, we'll do point five there right, it's next oh, it doesn't it doesn't shrink them they're still oh. like you're better off doing like maybe 48 Trying to look through the highlight grabs from yesterday for that bubblegum coral scene. So, there. Um. That's kind of a pain. It becomes such a blur, you forget all of this stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. Did we answer the Mariana Trent question? No. We were looking through images. Mm -hmm. Roger. I can't remember what it was. There was a question about the Mariana Trench. Anyone been there before? Fiona is from the northern Mariana Islands, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, no, never been there. Nor have the Tonga I. Trench, South Arc. Remember Marianas? Or the Mar no, sorry, Marianas Back Arc. The moon is so bright that it, I can like see the bow and the water. Really, listening. Ah, oh, there it is. Found it, finally. That's that bubblegum coral, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, someone showed me a picture of the moon from last night, and I was like, how'd you get, do you have a long exposure photo on your phone? And they're like, no, it was just that bright. It was crazy. It's pretty bright right now. Look at that! Wow. I guess you can't um, look at it lar Look at it large. Maybe I can just change this. Ah! Jumped on the page on me. I lost it. It's got to be a better way. So that car we just saw was the one that glows also. That's what I told myself to grab. I was like, there's one more thing I can grab while I'm heading to the head. I can grab the book that I was talking about, but I oh. forgot. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, I took your computer away. What's, um... That was fun. I have no idea how you got to those pictures. I was like, well, I have the ability to look at those pictures? Ah, there's new messages. Um.
You got your headset? Huh? So tell us what a, what a coral reef monitoring technician does. Um, as a coral reef monitoring technician, I can only speak on behalf of where I'm from. I'm not too sure if it's different everywhere else, but for us, we kind of, you know, we have different areas that we observe and we typically go onto the fore reef. We lay out a 50 meter transect line along the reef. And, you know, depending on your position, you can either, you know, along that 50 meter transect line, take um, note of the different inverts in a five meter radius along that line, or you could be, um, measuring the different coral diversities in the area. Same thing goes for inverts, five meters across. And then for me as a marine monitoring tech, I, for every meter, I kind of take a picture and those pictures are sent back to our office and it's analyzed using a software call, called Coral Point Count and Excel Extension. And then all of that information is then transferred onto a mass database where, you know, it's open to the public and nonprofit organizations and oh, really? yeah, for everybody. I think we also do like coral mosaics as well. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, familiar with that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, what was the software you said before? Uh, coral point count and Excel extension. Okay. I know like some people, they, for the 50 meter transit line, they kind of like record slowly lo along the way. I don't know. That's kind of like an older method. Now everyone's just like taking pictures every meter. Can you stitch them together, you said? Uh, we don't stitch them together, but um, they're kind of labeled so we know which one comes after the other. Okay. And um, on the software, it's kind of, it comes off as like, you know, in a quad type form and then five random points are placed along the screen and you kind of just identify whatever is under that point. Right. Yeah. Cool. Hey, Ryan. How, of how oh. often do you go do the survey? Um, it really depends on the time of the year. At this time, we're usually observing like the lagoon area and then towards the summer when the waters are calmer and the weather's not so bad, we go out onto the reef and we also, you know, visit the other islands as well, Tinian and Rhoda, and we also get information from there. And then towards maybe fall, it's usually a typhoon season for us. So we kind of stick back to doing the lagoon areas. Yeah. Is, do you guys use that too? Not that specific tool. Um, I've used similar things to like put random points on a screen mm. before and then count them to see how much coral cover there is in an area or something. Yeah. Uh, I have a colleague at URI who um, has a project in Micronesia and they're doing something similar. Oh, no kidding. But I, I forget the name of the software that he mentioned. I, I wrote it down in my notes somewhere, but... Um, do you, do you know where in Micronesia? to center your vehicle. And um, how do you turn center vehicle on I'm that I'm not off? sure exactly, but mm -hmm. it's with the how do you turn it off? Ulithi I forget people how. In, in the um, huh? One World, One Reef uh, group. I'm mm. not sure if you know where they are. Probably Palau, maybe. Yeah, probably. But yeah, we do similar things oh, in the deep sea with taking like successive pictures, either with yeah. like an autonomous vehicle yeah. or uh, an ROV, whatever. Mm. And uh, and then you can use certain softwares based on I the geo remember. position of each I picture that sort of place them all together, and then you make a, a really cool sort of yeah. mosaic of all the pictures. Same. There's some in the, the thing, hallway it down in time. the main deck. Oh if, no, kidding! If you walk, the, one of some of the big pictures on the wall are from the photo oh. mosaics. Oh. Yes, I've seen some of that. Uh, Katachi's uh, professor, Chris Roman, um, helped really pioneer the way the mm. stuff is done. In mosaicing? Yeah. 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 And uh, Gabby Inglis, who was out on the previous cruise, uh, got her PhD studying uh, the methods to do, do that photogrammetry ah. with the ROV. I can imagine it's a lot more difficult using the ROV, yeah? Actually, you can control it quite well, because uh, 
we, we're not doing it on this cruise, but mm -hmm. because it has the Doppler velocity log and the precision mm -hmm. software, uh, oh, yes. precision navigation, we can, the, the pilot can put it into auto, auto head and, and auto, uh, put it all in autos and drive, drive it, have the computer mm -hmm. drive the RV basically. Mm -hmm. And then you do your uh, photography like really precisely. Alexa, move vehicle forward uh, 3.5 meters. <laughs> It yeah, has very impressive uh, auto XY functionality on uh, Hercules because it's not um, dragging around a lot of tether or um, umbilical like a free flyer. It's, right. it's amazingly accurate. Centimeter accuracy. Rich, this is Nav. Oh, uh, I started, so I started, I kicked him into gear uh, a while back. Um, just letting you know that uh, we'll reach the surface at approximately uh, in 40 minutes, so 11.40. We started streaming Katachi around 1,000 meters, just because, uh, well, two reasons. George wasn't sure how the ship would behave, and also because we were still under the ship. So I wanted to get everything sorted out before we got up there, and just to make sure it's uh, yeah. not going to have any issues with the current. And not surface under the ship. Sure. Yeah, I had to. I couldn't uh, bring the vehicle around, so it's easier just to move the ship. Don't want to be late. Get one demerit from the deck chief if you're late. You go, yeah. <laughs> it's like the equivalent of the bosun here, huh? Yeah. yeah. How's our audience doing? Dwindling down? They're still bringing in a lot of information i feel there's a lot of um talking about dan <laughs> they love dan on huh? you, on, uh, there's a lot of, you gotta come check out these comments the later fan club. <laughs> <laughs> and um there was a little comment about if we can see the stars pretty good from here so when we had that bad weather there were no stars to be seen none at all but um i think I wasn't able to actually look at the night sky tonight, but I'll go have to check it out. But um, the first couple of nights when we were just still in near Oahu and Kauai, I got to get a good handle of, of the stars. You could see the North Star, Polaris, um, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, Orion's Belt, Taurus, yeah. Corvus. I'm just trying to name all the stars that I could identify. You yeah. said it's uh, almost a full moon, so or mm -hmm. in a couple of days. I yep. believe it'll be full moon in a couple of days. So, a lot of the small stars will be drowned out by the moon's light, yeah. which is kind of good for making sure you only see the important stars. There you go. We did some uh, survey work with a ROV on a on a crabby boat out of um, Lake Union, Pacific Northwest. And it was owned by a husband and wife team who actually, they live in Hawaii and they would uh, fly over and bring the boat out during the crabbing season. But we hired it for a couple of years in a row and um, they were both had their captain's license, but she was, uh, she navigated, so she worked the night shift and he worked the day shift. And um, she would navigate the boat all night by the stars. So we were live boating, surveying, and uh, maybe up to a thousand meters or so in the wow. in the That's strait amazing. in there. But yeah, I spent some time on the bridge up there. It was amazing how accurate she could steer that boat. She would play a game, 
to see it, how well she could navigate without watching the, the nav screen. Huh. And she turned off all the lights on the front of the boat so she could watch the stars from the bridge at night. Well, I'm sure that's how early <laughs> totally Native Hawaiians off. found yeah. their way to the islands, right? I mean, hundreds of miles away, some of them. Yeah, that's um, some of the knowledge we teach our kids at the organization I work at day to day. We teach them the Hawaiian Star Compass and how to identify the stars and wow. make sure we have a good dead reckoning and are heading in the correct direction. What what do you say? The Hawaiian Star Compass? Yeah, we have a um, there's a Hawaiian Star Compass and it's um it's actually based off of the Micronesian Star Compass called the Pafu. Oh really? Yeah. I did not know. I guess we all like to share things, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm yeah. From words and phrases to navigational tools. Nice. Yeah. So what what's the what's the star compass? So the um, the Hawaiian star compass is called the Kukuluo Kalani, and I think um, is there like a wind compass that does that that exists right? There's like a wind compass that exists, and I think it's based off of it. There's a little bit of the wind compass that's incorporated into the Hawaiian star compass. Um, hmm. I know Thompson uh, created the Hawaiian star compass to help him navigate hmm. the Hokulea when they're on his first voyages and um, the way he did it there are 36 houses each house is about 11.25 uh, degrees wide and um, it's it's a circle each each house has a name and a function and in those houses live the stars so you need to memorize the house names and then you can memorize where the stars live and once you identify where those stars rise and set, then you can create your your heading from there. So north is obviously zero degrees, and um, you just go from there. Wow. Tan my lap. I'm, I, I need to grab out my notebook to try and tell all you guys all the answers to Very cool. <laughs> where so the stars what's rise the and set. Um, What's the image in the center of the? I just had to Google it. What's the image in the center? It's like it's a. A bird. Do you see a bird in the center? Yeah. What kind of bird is it with the V tail there, a swallow tail? Um, I believe it may. It could either be a frigate bird or a naughty tern. Oh yeah. Yes, and um, so. Huh. The noy the naughty tern the noyle is a great bird for navigation, and um. It'll tell you where land is. So in the morning, it um, it will leave land to go out and grab food. And then the night, it'll fly towards land. So depending on where uh, where you see the bird and when, that'll tell you where, where land is. As, uh, as we've seen, there are many birds in the ocean. Some of them stay in the ocean, and some of them aren't necessarily ocean-going birds, so it's it's helpful to identify identify the birds and they help you to see and then also the bird is there for you to help to help you understand where the stars should be depending on where you want to go a basic and there's uh, a really easy one is like if you want to go um, north you want the bow of your ship or your the nose of your bird to face north and then to your beam will be west and south, east and west. And then to the stern will be the, the Southern Cross. How cool is that? Yeah. Mouse compass, east where the stars rise is at the top of the circle. West where the stars set is at the bottom. North is to the left and south is to the right. Mm-hmm. And did I say that right? M-A-U apostrophe S? M A. Oh, uh, that, that's a different. Oh, there's dozens of them. Oh my gosh. Quite a few names, yeah. Um, north is Akau. Uh -huh. uh, east is Hikina. West is Komohana. 
south is Hema. Now I need to look up a couple names so that I can be a better teacher and give you precise star names. <laughs> I know Me is Corvus, and I believe I better not say the wrong thing, so I better just look it up. So, I'm sorry, what do the houses represent? I don't. The houses um, represent where the stars rise and set. So everything, as you said earlier, everything will rise on the east and set on the west. Um, and then there are also names of the quadrants. And those are the names of the winds. And my name comes from one of those quadrants. Um, southeast, so let's start with the Ko'olau. Ko'olau is northeast, and Ko'olau wind is the wind that comes from the northeast. Mm -hmm. And then we have Malanai, southeast. Then we have Kona, um, southwest. Then we have Ho'olua, which is northeast, uh, no. Northwest. Northwest, yes. And um, so what the compass does is that the stars will be mirrored from the east to west, but then the wind will cross through the canoe. So if the wind is coming from Ko'olau, it will cross through the canoe and exit through to Kona. If it's coming from Malanai, it will cross through the canoe from Malanai and exit out through to Ho'olua. And the swells do the same exact thing. They cross through the canoe and you can try and identify where, where the swells are coming from. And that will help you keep a good bearing, keep that good dead reckoning. If you can always keep those swells hitting the same corner or um, make sure you quarter those swells on the exact same spot of your canoe every single time. Once, once those swells change, then you know whoever is steering needs to fix their heading. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's helpful at all. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. There's, so there must be some uh, some historical images of, the, of these so the compasses that are... Kukulu Okalani is modern, made. Um, uh -huh. Nainoa Thompson, who actually he lives, he's still alive today. He created the Kukulo Kalani, or the Hawaiian Star Compass. Um, so it's not ancient history like it may seem to be. However, the Pafu, the Micronesian Star Compass, is this sort of ancient intuition kind of history that was passed on from generation to generation, from navigator to navigator. Um, and that was taught to Papa Mao, who is the person that is credited for bringing navigation back to the canoes that we all see today, Papa Mao. And he was taught by his grandfather when he was a kid. Um, and they say the first lesson you learn before even stepping onto the ocean and onto the canoe, the first lesson you learn is Pafu, which is the, Hawaiian, the Micronesian star compass. And that Pafu is translated to counting the stars. And I think the next step would be Arum, and uh, and um, that would be you got to mirror the stars. So whatever star is in front, you must name the star that you would see in the back of you. And then the next step would be you have to name the star in front, in the back, and to your beam, side to side. So really memorizing and internal internalizing the compass as much as possible so that when you get to the canoe, you're not trying to memorize the names, you already got it. Now it's just identifying the name to the star. And there are similarities and differences between the Pafu, the Micronesian star compass and the Hawaiian star compass. Yeah. For the Micronesian star compass, each each point, each name, is a star, or or a star constellation. Whereas in the Kukulu Kalani, each house, each name, is just a place, and you got to identify the stars that will continuously rise from that one house. 
So is it is it popular now to do excursions at night in the between the islands, or do you uh, just like go out and then come back? Or? Yes, it is popular, and actually, right now, is um, there are some voyaging canoes making their trying to make their way to Tahiti in efforts to practice navigation using the Kukulu Kalani, using the stars, using the swells, um, using their seamanship skills. And then just like how Justin had said, um, some of those voyagers come up into the Papahana Mokua Kemeri National Monument to practice and train. Tahiti. That's Tahiti. not exactly an evening excursion, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> there there are evening excursions though. Um, you just gotta find the right person that'll take you out in the middle of the night to see the stars. <laughs> so do they do like several days? It must take several days to get between some of the islands. Um I have no idea. It takes it takes about half a day to get from one island to the other um, depending on the captain the crew and the vessel you can make it a sail at night time so that we have the stars but then it's also like um, Oahu um, there's a lot of light pollution there so in the night you just see a big glow from an island and you can be like that's Oahu yeah. <laughs> And then um, I remember some stories about um, when the voyage was coming home from Tahiti that they could identify Hawaii Island because of the red glow that you would see, which is the lava that was coming from Hawaii Island and the volcano that we have there. And there are some actually real awesome images that we I might be able to find online from us that Herb Kane, who is a, one of the founding members of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. So is that, is, are they um, people that are just doing that as a hobby or are they taking, um, are they taking like tourists or passengers with them? The Polynesian Voyaging Society um, focuses on training Hawaiian and community navigators to navigate, I believe. Uh -huh. There are certain catamarans that take tourists out for tours, but I don't think it's really focused on teaching the tourists how to sail and Hawaiian navigation and all of that. And then the... Um, I, 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 I lost myself in your question. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I was just curious if, um, I, it would be like almost like an expedition, I guess, or like, mm -hmm. a, you know. You'd have to know somebody. It's not like you can probably book a, book a charter. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't mean like a total walk on tour. It's more like a, yeah. I don't know, if you were going to uh, Africa, you would go on a safari, right? It's not <laughs> right. Something you would have to arrange privately, not look in the phone book and stand in line kind of thing. Yeah. It's uh, popular like in the Pacific Northwest. They have guides, local guides that will uh, take you out for, uh, you know, you can do a, a couple day excursion or several weeks down some of the wild rivers that we have in the Pacific Northwest that are, you know, they're pretty isolated. You don't see any people for days. Basically, whatever you can put in your in your canoe or your kayak and uh, yeah. camp along the way. And same with uh, um, British Columbia. You know, some of the fjords up there, they just take off and, and go. You don't see people for days. But you obviously have to have a local guide or you would be lost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're making pretty good time. We'll be up 
early. Should I warn uh, folks? Or? I think Katachi went down and talked uh, to Mark, Mark, didn't you? Mark was sitting. He was yeah. up an hour ago, so. Okay, good. Mark is hanging out on the social deck. It's it's likely we'll hit um, we'll hit the thermal climb here and slow down to 13 meters a minute, which we have the last couple times. Okay. Looks like we're going to be early, and then we completely come to a screaming stop when we hit the ceiling. <laughs> uh, last night we were early for a while, and then we were almost tragically late. We wound up on deck right, I think it was just a little after midnight, wasn't it? Yeah. All right, I'm going to sign off watch and go help on deck then. Thank you, Dwight. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dwight. Right. Thanks, Dwight. Thank you. There's a comment. So I can stay up till 4 a.m. looking at samples. <laughs> Is that winch lock uh, built in, or did you guys introduce that mechanism? I wonder, Dan, did you ever get seasick before, ever? Did I get seasick? Mm hmm Oh, yeah. When I was a, uh, oh, I don't even know if I was a teenager yet. I used to uh, go out with my father and his uh, friend and sail from uh, San Diego, San Diego Bay to Catalina. And uh, coming out of San Diego Bay, kind of get uh, a pretty good swell there, kind of a cross swell on the way to Catalina. And my brother and I would be sick the whole way. <laughs> <laughs> did you just grow out of it one day? Yeah, we did that uh, during the summer. We would basically do that every weekend. After a while, you get used to it. It was on a small, uh, oh, I think the first time we made the trip was like on a 28-foot sailboat. Mm. And yeah. uh, and we did that for a few years. And then uh, my dad and his business partner bought it a little bit bigger, I think a 30, 35-footer, a little bit bigger sailboat. Uh, two masts on it. Wow. Fun. Uh, it wasn't quite as uh, spicy <laughs> on the way out, but. Cool. Thank you. 
how about you, Paul? How's your how's your sea legs coming? Yeah, I'll usually get a a little seasick the first day or two of every trip. Um, not too bad, but yeah, I definitely I definitely get a little bit. There's still one motion that gets me is when the boat's doing the kind of the corkscrew thing, mm -hmm. especially on the bigger vessels. And I just you know, get kind of lethargic and tired. Yeah. Grumpy. There's usually like one or two days per cruise that I'll just sleep for like over 12 hours. Like I take a nap in the middle of the day and I just pretty much don't wake up until dinner. Yeah. Mm. Let your body get used to it. Yeah. I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the kids they see come out now are wearing the patch, and they never their body never acclimates because they're mm. yeah, because they're always wearing the patch. Yeah, they're always wearing the patch. So. I How are you doing, Ryan? How's your sea legs it. coming? Doing good. Got the pretty this sick one good. today. The other day. Since then, been pretty good. Mm -hmm. Being in the van can send me a little. But <laughs> uh, just want to make sure that the tanks are secured, air tuggers are enabled, um, and please uh, track forward at 0.3 knots. Uh, Um, let me confirm with the ROV pilots. Is 0.5 knots fine? Um, yeah. The pilots say that 0.5 knots is fine. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, we're making our way to the surface. We're at about 200, or where, who is that? Is that 250 meters. 250 meters, awesome. How's your sea legs, Kotachi? <laughs> Not great when, the, when we're doing the transits. Mm. Um, and so if during the transits, I'm usually in the data lab, which is located in the front of the boat, I want to say. Um, it's, it's pretty rough in that room. 
Mm -hmm. Do you guys have much windows down there? We got a couple, but mm -hmm. I think it's just the motion of that room and then the floors are at a weird angle. I don't know. I'm just finding excuses now. <laughs> There's like a slant in the yeah. ground. I, I know that much and that definitely makes it a little yeah, bit the, more challenging. The boat runs uphill towards the bow, yeah. which can mess people up. It definitely uh, moves around a lot more in the data lab than it does yeah. Yeah. in the okay. after the ship. Yeah, I'm not that up then. Yeah. No. Definitely. No, a lot of people, the, the data lab is taking a lot of people down. Yeah. Well, especially when I have, uh, my main job during mapping transits is to babysit the mapping software, staring at a lot of screens. Mm. Um, can be a little bit challenging. But, I mean, today, um, I accidentally set our transit a little bit short. Um, so we got a little, <laughs> we, we had some more time at our site where I got to, everyone got to acclimate. A lot better after that. I'd rather rock up early. I think we often rock up late and it's harder for the folks on deck getting ready and most of the RV, you know, especially when the weather's rough or getting beat up down there when we're trying to get the vehicle ready to go over this side. It was nice to come up on DP early and like, ah, oh, get a breath. Roger that. No complaints from the ROV department there. Gonna have to ask George for a suggestion on our watch name. Unless we decided, we, did we decide a watch name for us? I don't know. I don't think we decided on anything. Yeah. George gets to decide for us, huh? He's the king. He is King George. King George, all right. King George and the Coral Hunters. King Ooh, George and the go. Coral Hunters. I'm down. I'm there so you go. Down. I like that. That's got a Polynesian ring to it. Yeah, it? <laughs> it does. I'll have to make a little poster for us. King George and the Coral Hunters are now live. <laughs> You brought all your I'm gonna your star stuff. compass for our logo. There you go. I got a internet search plan for after shift. Uh, <laughs> I, I like old compass images, or even old ones that yeah, new yeah. ones that look old. I have one plan for the garden at home, <laughs> collecting stones and bricks, cool. and p bits of wood. Are, um, what watch are we, A, B, or C? I'm not None. sure. 8 to 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, C, there's right? uh, traditional names for the, uh, what, the nautical watches. So there's a mid-watch, and um, I'd, I'd have to cheat and pick up my phone. Yeah. Trevor called this the gourmet watch. Well, I <laughs> I think because we get to make all the meal times. Yeah, I don't think that's a traditional nautical. <laughs> no. That's a Trevorism. That's a Trevorism. <laughs> Trevorism. I see Jess out there with her yellow toque on. That's not Jess. That's no, uh, Kylie. Kylie. That's Kylie has no. a yellow one. Kylie has the yellow uh, headscarf on. I mean, uh, Jess does. She just went out of the camera view. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Herc's getting a rest. <laughs> Go ahead, Bridge. Roger.
One four zero seems to be the hot ticket. I said one four zero seems to be the hot ticket. It's got all the ducks in a row. Is that their form of an engine, Malinai? The shark? The, I wouldn't say this is, <laughs> the shark is the <laughs> engine, <laughs> but um, I would say that the shark is a navigator and oh. leads the way to where to go. And uh, a part of that is that, that magnetic sensor that the shark has to feel where the hot, plumes are. Please correct me. <laughs> no correction needed. I don't know. That sounds good to me. Yeah. You want to help me out with some Hawaiian pronunciations back there? Yeah, let's go. Well, I'll start with your name. See if I can get that right. Ma Malanai? Malanai. Malanai? Yeah. So Mal and I, and then Kona, that's an easy one. Then uh, nor n uh, Northwest is? Ho'olua. Ho'olua? Mm-hmm. Ho'olua, then Ko'olua? Ko'olau. Sa sorry, say again? Ko'olau. Ko'olau. There you go. I still don't have your name right. Mal and I, no. Say it, you gotta say it again. If you try and say the A as a A, ah, Ah, Malanai. Malanai. There you go. I actually got it right. Now, there's... You'll have it wrong by tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> all all um, we can do is practice. <laughs> so, are you familiar with the term boxing the compass? Boxing the compass. Is that where you take the take four corners of the vessel? No, there's actually 32 points on a traditional compass so there's well there's the four cardinal points right northeast uh -huh. south and west then there's the inner cardinal points the northeast and uh, or uh, yeah northeast southeast uh, southwest northwest southwest yeah and then so that's eight right mm -hmm. and then there's a whole bunch more like north by northeast and I can't I used to be able to do it I'd have to Look at the cheat sheet to do it now, but I see on the on the Hawaiian Star Compass there's I haven't counted them yet here. One, two, seven should be I believe. Well, there's the four. Mhm. Mm so, so we can do those. Uh, so the one at the north, A K A U. Uh, Akau. Akau. Mhm. Mm and then uh, east is Hikina? Hikina, yeah. Hikina. And then south is, how do you say that one? Hema? Hema. Hema. <laughs> I'm making it horrible. <laughs> and then west? Is Komohana. Komohana. I'll never be able to pronounce them, but at least be able to recognize them when somebody says them. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole bunch of ones in between. Yeah, so um, do you notice how they repeat in each quadrant? Oh, yeah, I see, I see. Uh -huh. They just um, sort of mirror each other. Yeah. And the way you would name it is you got a name. If you want to identify, then you would um, you would say the quadrant name and the house name. So 
la ko'olau, la malanai, la ho'olua, la kona. And that helps you identify. I see. Mm -hmm. So whatever star will rise at la ko'olau will set in la ho'olua. Uh -huh. Well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. We're into the double digits of meters. We are getting there. Yeah, we're discussing uh, some strategy up here for surface current. We did the kind of a left turn glide. That's interesting that the dead stick. Continue on the track till. No, it's yeah, it's not a big. I think we just keep doing what we're doing and get Atlanta on deck, and then we could. Oh shoot. <laughs> Well, it's nice to, uh, so I haven't given any command inputs to the vehicle for uh, basically since we started streaming. I've been, and then we uh, we slowed down a bit there, obviously, to give poor Hercules a rest. It was working really hard. <coughs> and uh, make our window, so. Well, it's interesting we hit that thermal climb. So we were doing 18 and then we're doing 13. Or well, we're doing about 15 or 16. Uh, just with no commands on it. It basically is following the winch now, right? But yeah, the last several dives is we've come up to the step that's. And I always thought it was the opposite, but Bob described it and it's hard to argue with someone who spent 20 years in Alvin. <laughs> yeah, it's like you come up and just stop and, what? I'm not there yet. Interesting phenomenon. I was going to learn something new uh, all the time. I'll see uh, once you hand the winch over there, Paul, I'll try and get back in the goalpost here. Yep, I'm uh Well, I still have that. Five meters off. Roger. Yeah, usually when we do that, so when the 
um, ships dressed in really hard when when it has its nose uh, the bow into the wind. But that's not the case tonight. So. Sometimes when we have a lot of wind on the bow, that's that's all like white water there at the stern. So. It looks like that just that little bit arrested the uh, starboard swing there. You ready on your lights, Paul? You yep. You've already tilted up. Just to have a last minute sanity check of our kibbles and bits here. That looks to be in the right place. That camera is so fast. I uh, need to uh, I usually stick that jaw over to the right so it doesn't get caught up on the sled when we're swinging around. Mm. Could probably come up just a bit more. I think I just understood why it's lambda and omega. Is that L and R? Omega is in resistance? No idea why they... Mm. That, that would make sense? sense. Yeah, left and right. Yeah. I did, I no. think so. Somebody was clever. This, this might be a Trevorism. Yeah, recovery salvo. All the boxes are closed, closed. And I bashed them really hard when, ooh, that one actually moved a little. Oh, it bounces back out. See that? Huh, put that one in the, uh, in the red which, book. Which one? See the sample tray? When I pull it in, it it drifts back out a little. Yeah, that would explain why the water is a little warm. Mm, interesting. Okay. That's interesting. Oh, well, looks like I'm quite a bit to the left. I'm gonna kill Atalanta lights were about five meters. Roger. You guys uh, stop Mezzo? Uh, yeah, we can. Yeah. Thank you. 